Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. Joining me today is a woman who has worked in several creative spheres, including acting, directing, producing, assistant floor management, location managing, and a researcher. My guest broke into the film and television industry when as a teen she appeared in the 1974 family film, Swallows and Amazons. Her other acting credits included the 1971 TV movie, Sided with Rosie, The Copter Kids, and appeared in an episode of The Two Ronnies. My guest went on to work in television production. She was an assistant floor manager on two episodes of Doctor Who in 1985, worked on the TV series Bluebell in 1986, and between 1986 and 1987, worked on the popular BBC soap opera EastEnders. As a producer, she worked on the educational programme Through the Dragon's Eye and the Inset series for the BBC. My guest is also a published author and has written several books and has revisited and shared her experiences of working on Swallows and Amazons with the books The Making of Swallows and Amazons and The Secrets of Filming Swallows and Amazons. On today's Your Take, I'm joined by Sophie Neville. We discussed Sophie's childhood and upbringing, her time working on the film Swallows and Amazons, and why she wrote two books on her experiences, her television production career, her love of writing, and living in another country. A very warm welcome, Sophie Neville. Thank you kindly for being a guest on your take. An introduction, a, a long introduction of trying to incorporate the different creative areas you've worked in. Things I've done. <laughs> yeah, over the course of your career. And we're obviously going to put them on under the microscope in today's interview in the next 60 minutes. But to begin with, let's go back to the very beginning. Can I ask you where and where you were born? And can you give us an insight on who your parents were, what they did for a living, and do you have siblings, Sophie? Well, I'm so old, I was born at home in my parents' cottage. My mother was very young, and I she then had um, two other um, little girls, and eventually she adopted um, uh, my adopted sister who comes from Vietnam. And I was born in Worcestershire, my father had moved there because he was working as a press and publicity officer for BIP, which was a huge conglomeration of um, plastics companies. <laughs> and he loved sailing, really loved sailing. And when he first, when he was a young man, he spent every weekend in the solar racing. And when my parents met and married, they spent 50 weekends of the year. So like every weekend of the year, except Christmas and Easter, I suppose, sailing, even though my mother doesn't really like it very much. Um, but I came along and put an end to that. But my father went on to develop the fiberglass hull. So fiberglass marine hulls, which was incredible, really. He was a very young man. And then he knew that he, he worked because he was like a brand manager and working on black brand development. He worked with the uh, the chairman of BIP, who was also keen on sailing. And when dad heard that someone had used fiberglass, this new resin that they, which they were using to make roofs, you know, those um, mm. roofs that are a bit translucent, the light can come through uh, and things like trays. Um, and they were wondering what they could do with this new product. Um, Dad said, I think we ought to set up a workshop and see if we can uh, manufacture, it can be used for the manufacture of fiberglass boat hulls and also car bodies. And actually still today, Lamborghinis, I believe, are made of um, glass fiber or resin. 
Um, but the car bodies are, are more complex, but uh, I don't know how many millions of fiberglass hulls there were. And what he said when he was old is he said, you know, we never thought what would happen when those boats reached the end of their lives. So this was like in the early 60s, late 50s even, and those boats are now reaching the end of their lives and there's a lot of them. And I'm picking up bits of fiberglass on the shore where I live. Anyway, he met mum in Italy on holiday and my mother was actually at RADA and she was accepted into RADA. She just told me recently that she was accepted into RADA because she got the highest marks in the country for speech and drama. And she was there with Hugh Whitmore, the playwright, and Susanna York. And she actually left rather early to get married. She married on her 21st birthday and then took her degree at home. because She just missed the last few weeks, the last end, end bits of, bit of the course, but um, she qualified and was able to teach on the strength of it. But she didn't do any acting till I was eight. And then when she, I was eight, she became a television presenter and she worked for HTV and she presented, she did the Envision announcing and read the news, uh, working from Cardiff and then from Bristol. And then she presented her own children's program and she had a program with Jan Leeming called Women Only. <laughs> so I would visit my mother on the studio floor uh, quite a bit. I mean, not all the time, but I, I was very much a child of the studio floor, which is incredibly rare and unheard of probably now. But then we would go along with mum, we'd accompany her uh, to things. I think she had to, she didn't have a nanny really, or anything like that. Um, so we went along and we were really good and quiet and waited and observed. So it was quite good work experience. And she was, she she read the book of ballet shoes her favorite book and she was quite keen I think for us all to act when we were little um we weren't asked whether we were, were keen or not as far as I can remember but she thought well why not you know it was a bit difficult because we lived in Gloucestershire my father moved to work for another company uh, and we lived in Gloucestershire and grew up in the countryside. So it was very difficult getting to formal auditions and things like that. But my mother had high hopes, I think. <laughs> An interesting insight into your family background, your West Country roots. Mm. Your father who was a very talented and, and skilled man. And your mother, who obviously, I guess, acted as a, a mentor. And we'll, we will obviously examine later your creative career in the the film and television industry before we do that I wanted to touch upon your education and ask where you went to school and would you describe yourself as naturally academic and did you have early career aspirations at a young age well this is went to school a long time ago I went to the the village school in Gloucestershire and apparently there was only one other child of my age and I don't think it was very good for me because uh, I, you know, they had one teacher for the infants. So they, you didn't get any teaching just for your specific grade. And the, uh, numerically, I was out of kilter with the others. So it wasn't very good. So they moved me to a private school, which was quite a sacrifice. And that was more challenging. And I enjoyed it. But... I don't think I was very well taught. And then my dyslexia wasn't diagnosed until I was doing English A-level at Sarancester Comprehensive. <laughs> so I battled with dyslexia. It's not that bad, so it's not, but I was a very slow reader. I didn't learn to read till I was nine, which was a huge embarrassment and struggle. I just couldn't crack the code. I was a visual learner, as a lot of little girls are, a lot of English uh, girls are. Actually, I'm not really English, I'm half Scottish, 57% Scottish, but I, I just needed to learn visually. And the written word flummoxed me. And then suddenly I could read and I just read and read and read. And my father was very good at supplying me with the books that he'd enjoyed as a child, notably Arthur Ransom. So I read. All of, I'd read nearly, read, read about seven of the Arthur Ransom books by the time I was 12. And 
really got stuck into books like all the Narnia books and um, Little House on the Prairie, Laura Inglis Wilde's books. Um, so the books of my generation, but I wasn't, but I did become an avid reader and but I still muddle my words. So I had this sort of disability that I had to overcome. But I don't know, maybe it's other things that worked out. Oh, sorry, my phone's gone off. Let me turn that off. Let's, um, let's pick up on your love of writing and reading and your creative flair. Obviously, you come from a creative family, and we briefly discussed your mum working in television. Um, but where would you say that love of creativity came from, apart from her influence? And how did you manage to get your lucky break as an actress? And can you recall your first acting credit? Oh, I, I got my first proper job, my first speaking, my first role in, in television, because I could play the piano. And I can remember putting my hand up, this big audition that my mother took me to uh, in Stroud, Stroud's subscription rooms. You see, I model my words, Stroud subscription rooms. And I worked very hard because the music didn't come until about three days before the shoot, before the, the time when we were gonna record my scene. And I had to practice for about seven or eight hours a day to learn very difficult, um, piece because it, it was the accompaniment to Laurie Lee, the boy who was playing Laurie Lee was playing it on the violin. It was amazing that they used that scene, but Laurie Lee was around at the time and mum knew him. And he said, oh, Sophie's playing the part of the little girl who was the first girl I ever fell in love with. And she was called Eileen Brown. And I don't think I said very much, but the piano playing was difficult and I was featured quite a bit because of this. And I was in the school scenes. I'd actually been in, I'd had non-speaking part in Arthur of the Britons. And in fact, my sisters had proper parts in that. My sister Perry played a woodchild and my sister Tamsin played Elka in Arthur of the Britons, which is a real cult classic television series. Oliver Tobias played King Arthur and Michael Gothard played his friend Kai. And Tamsin had this part and she turned up and was immediately plonked on in front of Michael Gothon on this huge horse. No one had asked if she could ride. But luckily, she could ride quite well. <laughs> um, and Sean Grumgill played her brother on the back and they were really good. And <laughs> went galloping off over the Winchester Hills. And then she went on for strength to strength. She did a lot more acting parts than me but all television. So she was uh, Anthea in The Phoenix and the Carpet. My mother played her mother in that. And then she played Linda as a child in the first BBC adaptation of Love in a Cold Climate when Judy Dench and Michael Aldridge were her parents. Hmm. Uh, and she had to ride for that as well. And my other sister was an extra and they'd engaged these stunt women to ride side saddle. But I don't think they'd actually been taught how to ride side saddle, whereas Tamsin was sent off for proper lessons. <laughs> and because we were learned to side saddle, my other sister, Perry, was we, she could also ride side saddle. <laughs> and stunt women were, were too frightened to um, do what they were asked to do, which was to take the horses over a five barred gate. So my sisters who were under 18 were, did the stunts effectively <laughs> because the stunt women hadn't got that far in the equitation. <laughs> so what I'm saying, I suppose, is we, we coped because we had skills to offer. Mm. And I think what comes out of it is you can be as creative as you, you fancy. And we're, we're all born to create. But it helps if you've got other skills and if you can specialise. And I could ride, I don't think I ride terribly well, but I'm a very experienced rider, not very technically brilliant, but I'm an experienced rider. And I've hardly ever worked with horses in a creative way at all. I've worked professionally with them. I've kept a big herd, but I, <laughs> I never worked particularly with them in film or television. I don't know why, it just didn't happen. 
probably just as well. Sophie, your CV covers several areas, including behind the scenes television and film related roles. But let's start at the beginning of your career. And mm -hmm. firstly, I want to find out what inspired you to become an actress and did you have any early influences? Well, I had no burning desire to be an actress at all. A letter arrived completely out of the blue, and this is, it must be so rare, but a letter arrived out of the blue. It was addressed to my father, who was on an overseas trade mission. My mother nearly didn't open it. She decided she ought to. It said theatre projects on it, and she took a deep breath and she, she never opened his mail as a principal, but she did. And when she opened it, it said, dear Mr. and Mrs. Neville. No, it didn't. It said, dear Mr. Neville. It said, Claude Watham, who is uh, the director of Side with Rosie, was wondering if you'd like to come for an interview because he's going to be making this film called Side with Rosie. Oh, no, Claude Watham is going to be directing Swallows and Amazons and asked if you'd like to come and interview for a part. And we literally drove to Heathrow, picked up dad, and he drove us into London. He'd just got off the plane. We drove into London and they took me for the interview in the West End, Shaftesbury Avenue. And the long and short of it was that on, because I'd worked hard on Side with Rosie and pretty well done what the director asked me, Claude Watham, against the odds, because I was too old and too tall, cast me as Titty and Swallows and Amazons. And so there I was, age 12, offered a, a major role in a British feature film. And what do you do? It was amazing. Um, I loved the books. I knew them well. I hadn't envisaged myself as titty at all. I was the older sister myself and quite bossy and much more like Susan, more practical minded. Uh, but I was offered that role and then after I had the lead role, Ditty is the heroine in Swallows and Amazons, I went for a number of other auditions, but only because I was asked. And I still wait to be asked. I wait to be asked to give, give talks. I wait to be asked to write things on the whole. Um, and so after that, I was, I went, I can remember, for a film test for Disney, but it didn't come off. And in the 70s, there was roaring inflation in England. So sadly, there weren't many films made, but there was a Children's Film Foundation um, film made, a different kind of financing. And I was given the lead part in that as an archery champion. And fortunately, <laughs> I'd, my, my parents were archery champions in a, within their club in a small mm. way. And mum had actually taught the Amazons how to shoot behind the scenes for Swallows and Amazons. And she's actually a very good teacher. And so she taught me how to shoot and I had extra lessons to be an archery champion. Although when I see it now, I quake at my technique. And that was pivotal in my life because I went on shooting with the longbow and actually that's how I met my husband. And I'm just off to a match this week and next week, two matches. So. It was the one sport I've been any good at, I suppose. Um, and that really came from the films because my sisters don't do it at all. Um, and I hold, well, two championship titles at the moment, counting oh, wow. very small clubs, but um, Worcestershire I was born and uh, West Barks. I actually went to school. Um, and then a, I've got the a uh, bigger match on um, Friday. But my stepson's been shooting for England, so um, it's a nice thing to have in common with the family I married into. They're all very keen archers. And that's what we do. And that's what I've been doing this, after, this evening, practising in the garden. Uh, we're just getting the four-year-old and the eight-year-old started. Um, Let's... Um, you mentioned Swallows and Amazons, which was a great career opportunity for you and you mentioned mm -hmm. about you know being given the opportunity to play that particular role a classic family film released in 1974 here's a book um they brought out the book of swallows and amazons they republished with a photograph of us on the cover so that's me yeah, that's, yeah. Um, um simon west playing my 
my brother John. And then here is the LP they made with the music from the film. The music was um, composed by Wilfred Josephs, mm. um, who also did the music for Cyrus Rosie um, and wrote Requiem for the, of the, for the Jews. Um, and so that was the LP. There's Virginia McKenna, who played my mother. Um, Can you, can you here's the flags. Okay. Yeah, the flags in the back, yeah. And this is um, Swallow's flag, which um, my character, which I, I sewed. And it's actually still got my stitches. I only really noticed recently that I, I actually sewed on screen um, in a scene that was cut, hit the cutting room floor, but the stitches remain. And that is the real flag from the film. And this is one of the arrows that the Amazon shot into the fire. And it's, um, it's, uh, Titty says, he's used to pour parrot's feathers. And so the Amazons fetched their arrows with um, their uncle's parrot feathers. And they called their uncle Captain Flint. And he had the green parrot. And when Titty finds um, the buried treasure, which is his book, he'd be writing on all summer as a reward, she's given the green parrot. And my big skill that no one asked about beforehand or thought about until we're actually shooting the scene on down water in a houseboat was, would I mind if the green parrot was on my shoulder? Oh. And this parrot was quite vicious. You know, yeah. the one woman parrots, you have to spend ages habituating them on the whole. And I had to do this scene with a parrot on my shoulders, his claws were so sharp, they dug right in. I think it was really brave of me. Anyway, someone had told me that if you stroke a bird, they won't attack you. If you touch one feather, they'll calm down. So I was stroking the parrot's neck for most of the scene, just so I could keep my, my face intact. Um, but actually after the film, I, my parents found a green parrot and we did have our own green parrot and he'd been hand reared and he was very friendly. And I was asked to be on Animal Magic. You remember Animal Magic presented by Johnny Morris? It's a bit before my time, but I do. Oh, um, I know, I, know I do know the programme. Yeah, it was a very popular kids TV. Yeah. And uh, they took a shot um, of me rowing up our lake where I learnt to row, but this lake we lived near on the, in the Cotswolds and with the parrot on my shoulder and that sequence was used to replace the 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 test card on BBC the test card with yes I do um, yeah uh, that tic-tac-toe um and the um the clown and then later on um just to explain I I it, I was given these two leading parts in feature films, but I really had no burning, I, I had no burning ambition to act at all, but I was quite interested in how films were put together. I was much more interested in what the director was doing. And we were just his little puppets, just doing exactly what we were told. And yeah, we had a bit of creative input, especially sort of on the, the charm front. And it's your face and your body and your actions and skills and your voice. But I was fascinated in the production and mm. the schedule and things like that. So I developed interest in working behind the scenes. And I had actually a burning ambition to direct, not to act at all. And I, back then, it was really impossible for an actor to become a director. Kenneth Browner did it and Clint Eastwood did it and, and a few other leading actors, but it's such different skills and different vision. Um, at the time, it was this sort of early eighties, it didn't seem to be a very good idea to try and make it as an actress and then become a director. At the time, people were becoming directors much more from editing. But I got a job, a holiday job, really, when I was 15, working as an assistant film editor. And it bored me rigid. I don't like doing that. <laughs> I worked for Tony Willard for five days on um, 
a BBC play called Abide With Me, which was shot um, near my parents' house and in our church. Um, so I thought, no, I don't want to go down the editing route. And I, I actually went into the BBC straight from university. I went to Durham University. I did a degree in anthropology. I was offered a salaried PhD, but I thought I'd try for the BBC general trainee scheme. Mm. And I was given a six month contract as a researcher and I worked initially on the book show and on Russell Harty, which was a live, um, we did the, the London show. So live um, uh, chat show. The talk and show host. Yeah. The yeah. Big show, the big show back in big, the Big, big, big show. 80s, and yeah. I did, I really set up, I did everything for the Christmas production, which was a huge project to give a 22 year old but I thought I knew enough about I put on plays at university I directed plays at university and I directed a pantomime and I thought well let's have a pantomime theme because then we can hopefully get big stars in their pantomime costume be quite fun get the audience to sing you know good live television and one of the other researchers managed to get Shelley uh, Shelley Winters over from America as Mother Christmas, but I had Peter Davidson and his wife, Sandra Dickinson, and Esther Ranson, who was amazing, amazing, getting the audience to sing with the graphics of the, the song comes down. And I had um, Matthew, oh gosh, other television presenter. Uh, um, I had a lot of household names in their costumes, which was hysterical. And Esther Ranson came in her pantomime boy, oh, Dick Whittington, she was playing, in her tunic, and she's got really good legs. And she was fabulous, really, she was fabulous. Um, so I did the research, I, I set up and uh, got hold of all these people and made that show happen. But it, had um, a finite, it was going to end with my contract. And the unit manager said, Sophie, that's no good. You're going to be out of a job when, when it comes to, there's no summer season when this series ends. You've got to line up your next job. Why don't you contact uh, this producer in drama series and serials? Because he has got the rights, or he is going to produce two of the Arthur Ransom books. And I went, ooh, ooh, okay. So I rang up this producer, which looking back on it was very brave of me, really. And he was great. He just laughed. I said, look, can I come and help you? I was in the feature film and I might be able to, I don't know, somehow help you with your drama that you're going to be doing. So I, he said, oh, I think I ought to take you out to lunch. Also unheard of at the BBC. No one took anyone else out to lunch. Anyway, I said, oh, you don't have to take me out to lunch. I'll just come over. I'm a general trainee. So off I went. And he was making the Arthur Ransom books, Coop Club and The Big Six, uh, on the Norfolk Broads. So they weren't about the Swallows of the Amazons at all. They were about other characters entirely. And it was fabulous. Because my salary was paid for by the general trainee scheme, the manager of Series and Serials took me on. Um, Joe wanted Joe Waters, the producer, needed help casting the children, because in these books, there's a big cast of children and teenagers who need to be able to sail boats and row boats, and i.e. they needed to be able to swim very well for safety reasons. Some, some of them, one of them had to jump off this boat and swim and go underwater, and uh, the children they needed had to be very confident in boats and also most of them had to have Norfolk accents so he said I need someone who can go up to Norfolk and find a selection of children to present to the um, director and I said okay that's fine I can do that I said if I find like four or five kids uh, who would be interested in going like for each part and so I started and I did use a contact from the movie Swallows and Amazons. And she didn't take part in the, um, the movie at all, but it was Anna Sher and 
Susanna Hamilton, the actress who played my sister Susan in Swallows and Amazons, went to Anna Scher's after school theatre club in Islington. And I went there because I thought, well, Anna's a good drama teacher. She might have some uh, children who might play some of the parts. And I didn't cast anyone from there, but I learned a lot from Anna. And I took what I learned in one evening to Norfolk and I went, I think I visited every school in Norfolk. And the difficult parts to find actually were the smaller parts, which were for teenagers, for 15, 14, 15 year olds and baddies. And it's very difficult to play the part of a villain well, especially when there's not much dialogue. But I got some really, really wonderful lads. And I was, I had to um, find identical twins girls. I had to find um, a girl who was in almost every scene to play Dorothea. And I had to play the lead boy had to be able to sail really well. And he had to be able to handle a small yacht. And I could not find a boy who was confident enough to take on this part. And Joe wanted, because it was a really leading role, so it was going to be, gosh, I think we were filming for 83 days. Had to be over 13 to legally be able to do that. And we're talking about four hours of television, so eight, eight 28 minute episodes. And I was right up against the deadline because the children's licenses had to be in on a certain date and they had to be in six weeks before you begin filming. It's the law. And I was really stressed. My aunt rang me up and said, could my cousin who is 13 come and stay? And I couldn't say no. So I said, yes, she must come and stay. And I thought, I've got to do something nice with her. And I booked us quite expensive tickets in the stalls of the theatre. And I took her along. And I was really like, oh, I'm meant to be casting children in Norfolk, not doing this. But I went along and we watched this musical. And we were sitting in the auditorium. And she asked me what I was doing. And I said, I'm looking for a boy who can sail. And I can't find anyone who can sail well enough. And it's really annoying me when I go to stage schools and the boys tell me they can sail when they can't because you're not going to be able to learn to sail in six weeks. You're just not. Anyway, so I'm like this. And I, then it's the, it's the interval. And I'm like this in the auditorium. And I see this, this boy behind me. And I think, oh, I think he looks just right. So he's sitting there with his sisters. So I said, oh, hi there. I said, oh. And I thought, I just go for it. So I said, you don't know any chance, you can't make any chance to sail a boat, can you? And his sister said, oh yeah, he's really good. He often takes the helm. And dad's got this catch in Devon. And he know he's really good. And he was such a nice boy. So confident and looked just right. And I said, oh, what's your date of birth? I said, when's your birthday? And he was 30 just before we finished filming. And I said, oh, when are you breaking up from school? He was going to break up from school before we finished filming. So I said, oh, um, yeah, I don't think I could meet your parents, could you? Can I meet your parents? And they said, oh, they're, they're in the bar. I said, could you take me to see your parents? I mean, would you say that now? This is the early 80s. So these three children take me to the bar. And I'm with my cousin, who's 13. And he said, oh, um, this is my mum and dad. And I looked up and there was David and Jocelyn Dimbleby. And I said, oh, hello. I said, my name's Sophie. Would you, mind, would you like to bring your son for an audition at the BBC tomorrow? Um, <laughs> and they said yes. And they came the next day and the director and um, the producer shook Henry Dimbleby by the hand and said, um, yeah, would you like the lead part in this television series? So I went and did almost what had happened to me, you know, complete mm. shot out of the blue. I did to Henry, poor Henry, um, what had happened to me. And then the director asked me if I would look after the children on location and uh, help prepare their lines. And there was a lot of those major parts so I ended up 
collecting Henry from his parents' house and driving him to Norfolk. And I, we stayed in a hotel near the locations and I looked after him and the lead girl and the twins. All the other members of the cast came from Norfolk, which was really great because they could live at home. And they were picked up on a daily basis. But um, uh, Henry was wonderful and the Dimblebees uh, rented a cottage for three weeks of um, the filming. We had Julian Fellows as the baddie and Rosemary Leach, yeah. who played Mrs. Lee inside with Rosie, had the lead part as Mrs. Barrable. So that was nice, um, how things come around. Um, nothing to do with me. It's just, I think she was cast before I even came on the team. But I worked on that serial for nine months of my life, it was actually much more important to me at the time than the movie Swallows and Amazons. But the movie Swallows and Amazons did well on television in the 80s particularly, and it's become uh, an enduring success, a sort of iconic British movie. It mm. was brought out on VHS with the Railway Children because they were both produced by EMI Films. It was actually made with the money, with the profits from the railway children. And then the Daily Mail released it as a free DVD when they brought out this book that I showed you earlier. Where's that gone? Let it bounce somewhere. And it kind of bounced back. And in um, 20, 2020, 12, 2013, I wrote to Studio Canal, who are the film distributors, and I said, um, would you mind terribly if I brought out my memoirs of, or would you like to publish my memoirs of being in the film? Because I kept a diary on location and it's quite interesting. I actually hadn't thought about it, but I was employing a formatter. And she said, Sophie, you starred in a film in the 70s. You really got to write about it. She was quite a film buff. And she said, everybody would love to know. So I brought out oh, I tell you what happened when it was the 30th anniversary out of the blue again the a researcher or assistant producer on country file got in touch with me and said Ben Fogel wants to he's we're putting together a uh a, um an item about swallows and amazons and where it was filmed in the lake district it's going to be presented by Ben Fogel and we wondered if you'd like to be interviewed on location. So I said, oh yeah, I'll come up. And I said, look, um, my parents shot all this silly footage behind the scenes. And they said, did they? Have you got it? And I said, yeah, I'll look for it. And my parents had kept it. My father had actually borrowed a Bolex from work. So some of it was on 16 millimeter. And then mum had one of those little cine cameras that we We'd, we'd acquired by collecting green shill stamps in the 70s. You've got these reams of green shill stamps. And my father was in sales, so he had a lot of mileage. <laughs> we'd be sticking these green shill stamps in books. And we bought this movie camera, which mum used to take behind the scenes footage on location. Not allowed now. She took, every day, she took about three photographs. And films were very expensive and expensive to... Um, get developed. Uh, and again, you're not allowed to take photographs on a movie location now, but she did then. So I had quite a wealth of uh, material, if you like. And for the country file um, episode, and it was so good, the, the, they had wonderful weather and what they collected was very good. Um, that Ben Fogel then um, presented Big Screen Britain, looking at other British movies and where they were filmed on location, like Whistle Down the Wind and the Dam Busters. I don't know if they did the Railway Children, but um, a number of wartime movies as well. And so I had, they put it on a DVD for me and they gave me a copy of the DVD. So I was able to bring out this book, which is called Secrets of Filming Swallows and Amazons. And this is a a uh, rare hardback. It's available on all the ebook platforms. And it's basically a multi, what they call a, a multimedia ebook. So it's a book, but it's got 14 little film clips and they're just home movie footage, but it's quite interesting 
to see how we shot it because it it explains how we filmed the sailing sequences in dinghies, i.e. children talking to each other in dinghies or from one dinghy to another dinghy or from one dinghy to the shore, which is quite difficult actually to achieve and how that was done. And I was able to put in all my mother's um, little behind the scenes snaps, but they were quite jolly and there were quite a lot of them. So this is a shot of me strangling the wardrobe master. <laughs> I don't know why, but they were quite fun. And um, uh, a lot of the crew went on to have amazing careers. So Ian Whitaker was the set um, decorator on this. So he set up Captain Flint's houseboat and he went on to be nominated for a number of Oscars and to win an Oscar, I think, or even two um, for set decoration. Uh, I think Howard's End or The English Patient. Here I am on location. I don't know if that's clear enough for you to see. Um, and it was so difficult that the location would be a boat on a lake, um, a very difficult movie to make and that made with very young people who went on to make most wonderful films. So it was very interesting putting this together. And when it came out, I got a lot of publicity and a lot of major newspapers. And so the rights were bought by Classic TV Press. And this is a wonderful publisher. I don't know if this will all be background, but here we are in Swallow. Here's Ronald Fraser playing, oops, playing Captain Flint. And um, I was, there I am. And this publishers, we have color plates in, in the middle of it. So mum's photographs are now in color. Mm. Of course, they're in color in the ebook if you've got a color screen, um, which everyone has now. Um, I remember when Kindle first came out, it was in black and white, but then people got Kindle bars and you can now have a Kindle app on your phone or your iPad. So they brought out that. And then they also got permission from Studio Canal to use the beautiful um, uh, official film stills like this. As here we are making Captain Flint walk the plank. And I drew maps. And what is quite useful, this is available as an ebook as well. And it's quite good to have on your phone if you go on holiday in Cumbria, because then you can find the film locations of your family and find uh, other locations relating to the Arthur Ransom books that I mention and have uh, uh, got maps and kind of directions so that you can find them and see where we made the film. So there's a map of Windermere. And this is where we shot uh, the near collision with the turn, which is um, one of the boats that take tourists up and down the lake. This is where we, the film opened on the railway. And then we visit the town of Bowness on Windermere, which in the film we call Rio. And then we stayed at Ambleside, which is at the head of the lake. And the film crew stayed at near Waterhead, which is here. Um, but the secret of filming Swallows and Amazons was it was actually filmed on four lakes. So mostly on Coniston Water, where you find Keel Island, Wildcat Island, and the, and the Amazon Boat House, and where the family stayed. And that's where Arthur Ransom went himself as a little boy with his um, brother and sisters. So here's my map of Coniston Water. And we filmed a lot at Bank Grand Farm, Holly Howe. And then one of my favourite scenes was with the charcoal burners in the woods, which was Grisdale Forest. And right at the southern end of the lake, that's where Arthur Ransom went on his holidays. And now you can, you can catch, um, from Coniston, you can take the gondola, which is a wonderful steamboat um, run by the National Trust that Arthur Ransom went on as a little boy. And he met a family on Peel Island and uh, their children inspired him to write Swallows and Amazons. Um, so Titty was a real little girl. and. Um, she was a quarter Armenian, but otherwise she was English, Scots, Irish, which is actually my heritage genetically. Um, and then it was all, it was then brought out by a third, I've got the third edition here really. Um, the Lutterworth Press now bring it out and they've redesigned it. And I 
a few more stories came down from the Lake District and I was able to add a bit to the credit list and things like that. But actually I'm going to work on a third edition for our 50th anniversary, which 50th anniversary of the filming will be uh, 2023, so um, next year. Um, May to July 2023 will be the 50th anniversary of the filming. And then it came out in cinemas in April uh, 1974. So 2024 will be the 50th anniversary of this, the screening, which is what uh, a lot of people remember because they remember it's like the first film that they ever went to see in the cinema. Um, and it made an impact on them. And so the book has been really well received by the thousands of fans of the film. And because it's an ebook, it's easy for people um, to, to read overseas. Uh, and there's a lot of fans in Australia and uh, New Zealand. And in fact, a lot of countries where they love camping and the outdoor life. So Sweden, Norway, Spain, um, Czech Republic, uh, they've dubbed it into Czech twice. Uh, and I've been asked if I'll go and speak there. Um, I, uh, Denmark, um, it was sold all over the world, but sadly not in the States. And it's very, there are a lot of Arthur Ransom's fans in North America. And I don't know if, <laughs> I don't think they can still get it. So that's a bit sad, actually. Um, whereas the the new the the twenty sixteen version of Swallows and Amazons that did very well in the states and it won two awards in the states. Um, I helped the producer get some of the key finance for that film. Um, so I'm really glad that it it did well in the states because they haven't, haven't seen my old film, um, but. It's screened on television in Australia. No one tells me when it's going to be on television. It suddenly is. <laughs> I keep a blog. It's called sophieneville.net. And I keep writing my popular demand. Um, little stories, or if I find out more about Swallows and Amazons, I've just found out about the guy who painted the poster. Do you want to see the poster? I've got one here. My sister wants it. Well, it's her birthday, so I gave her one of her birthday on yesterday. And this is the film poster. And it was painted by one of the leading poster painters and oh, a very wow. famous Italian poster, film poster painter. Ah, so that's the original quad poster, yeah? Yeah, that's ah. the original one. It's quite valuable. And there I am in pink. But he was very good at getting likenesses. I was, was not very happy when I first saw this because <laughs> I look a bit like, I look a bit stupid, in fact. And I thought, who's sailing the boat? And why am I wearing pink? Because I went, I am wearing a pink shirt in my costume. But when he, he, when he painted Michael Caine, he gave him a flowery suit in br bright green. He just changed the costumes really nearly. Oh. You've you've spoken in great detail about obviously your, your fondness for an experience of working on Swallows and Amazons and the, the books you've written. And you've also spoken in quite some detail about the work you've done behind the scenes, behind the camera as well. I only to... on yeah, only on that one scene, which sure. was right at the beginning of my career in television. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to ask you. Who have you enjoyed working with the most in front and behind the camera? Mm. And have any of your colleagues acted as mentors? And have you gained greater knowledge about the industry from any of them? Oh, well, Claude Watham, who directed Siren of Rosie and Swallows and Amazons, was an amazing director, really ahead of his time. And he was a major mentor in my life. And um, when I went for my interviews at the BBC to be a general trainee, which is incredibly difficult to get, I, I went and asked his advice. And he said things, very simple things that I would remember, like, use your time well. As a director, use your time well. Okay, and that stuck up, that stuck in the head and I 
said that in my interview. And then, but you know, you get busy and you fall away. The actors, I, I worked with many wonderful, wonderful actors. I actually think that Susanna Hamilton, if, if I was going to act again ever, which is probably most, most unlikely, but working with Susanna Hamilton, she just made it so easy for me because I had a quite difficult part with difficult dialogue, but she really anchored us. And when I was at the BBC, when I was an assistant floor manager, one of the most lovely uh, series I worked on was again for the producer, Joe Waters, who is a lovely man and an inspiration in many ways. Look him up. He did Dixon of Doc Green, Zed Car Squadron, a lot of major television series. He was at the right place at the right time when it started. And he asked if I would work on My Family and Other Animals. So that was the first BBC um, version of Gerald Durrell's book that's um, come out recently as the Durrells. And a wonderful actor called Anthony Carf was in that. And I helped cast the little boy who played Gerald Durrell because you have, when you're looking for children, you have to go to schools and, 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 and interview a lot of boys very difficult part and the little boy was in it such a lot that when after a while he just legally couldn't be in front of the camera much so I would sometimes put I even put on his costume and I, it was my job to read in his lines when the other actors were having their close-ups and Anthony Carr said oh good right Sophie's now Gerald and that makes it easier and of course it was easier because he was the little boy was 13 and he would get fidgety and um I made an effort to try and reproduce his performance but act well and sympathetically so that when the camera was on the other actors for their close-ups I would be as good as I possibly could be for them just for them you don't hear my voice cuts to the little boy speaking. So there were a lot of setups in the Durrells. I, I don't know if you know the story, but Mrs. Durrell was a great cook and it ends up, there's a lot of scenes around the table. So you can imagine they do a group shot and then they, the director, a wonderful director actually called Peter Barber Fleming, he'd shoot the little boy's close-ups first while the child was still fresh. And then he would do the older brothers and sisters. So Anthony Carf was playing Larry and he would always be last his close up and it was like, but by that time I was reading Gerald Durrell's lines and he, he was particularly wonderful. Hannah Gordon played Mrs. Durrell. Gerald Durrell came out on location. He said, oh, such a beautiful woman playing my mother. <laughs> um, and I really enjoyed, I was so privileged to work in drama production on major series like, as you said, uh, Doctor Who and EastEnders and Bluebell. Caroline Pickles played Bluebell. Um, and I did a vet series called One by One and a police series called Rockcliffe's Babies. Um, and I was in, I, I was a runner on Chartres and Caldecott. So I worked my way up in production from, but it was odd because on Coop Club and the Big Six, I was actually a casting director. They didn't have casting directors in the BBC at the time, but this funny little niche I opened up for myself as a casting director of children. And because I'd been a researcher on Russell Harty, I then, did quite a lot of research in the drama department, which was also a job they didn't use researchers, but on Bluebell, they really needed a film researcher because um, the director wanted to, the script called for a run-in of this wonderful um, historic footage uh, that was stored at BFI, the Pathy Film um, Archives of, chorus girls dancing in line and they wanted to use that footage and we needed to watch that footage to do the research um, so that we could get it historically accurate. So I actually worked as a researcher on Bluebell and then, but the manager said, Sophie, if you want to be a director, you've got to 
go back to the beginning and you've got to work as a runner and then assistant floor manager and you've got to work your way up in production. So that's what I did. I became a runner, which I loved. <laughs> it's really good being a runner. Um, it's one of the, actually one of the best jobs on, on, on a film crew. And then I became the assistant floor manager when you've got responsibility for the rehearsals. So, for instance, running the rehearsals and the rehearsal schedules for EastEnders, um, when Leslie Grantham played Dirty Dan and Anita Dobson was Angie and... Those um, days. Yeah, and Gretchen yeah. Stanton played Ethel. And her little pug dog had been the pug in Coot Club and the Big Six. And I'd actually cast the pug dog. And that's why I was called Little Willie, because in Coot Club and the Big Six, he's William. Or he's just in Coot Club, sorry. He plays, the dog's called William. So they said, oh, no, he's called William. <laughs> that's why they called him Willie. Um, and it was so nice to be on the East End of Set, you know, in Albert Square with a little pug dog who I'd worked with in the Norfolk Broads. Um, oh, I got on well with Gretchen Franklin. And, of course, um, um, uh, who, who's, who plays Doc Cotton? June. Oh, she, she recently died, didn't she? Yeah, June, she it, has. Did June um, Brown? Yeah, June Brown. I, yeah. I absolutely adored her. I worked on EastEnders so very early on, not the very first uh, episodes, but 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 I did three months and then three months. So I must have done about 12 episodes. But by that time, I was training other people to do my job. So it was me and a trainee. I made two terrible mistakes. Oh, my goodness. I don't think I think I can mention them here, but um, because I was training the trainees and let them make suggestions, I nearly came to grief. Um, but um, we pulled through. So I did a lot of foreign filming, um, filming uh, My Family and Animals entirely on location in Greece. Absolutely amazing that we could do that with a half Greek crew, learn a bit of Greek. Uh, and uh, we liberated Paris for Bluebell uh, and filmed in Manchester and the Peak District for One by One with a leopard and a lion and monkeys and an elephant in Harwich. I mean, extraordinary opportunities. And then I became a location manager in London, which was actually, I thought it was a, be a lovely job to be a location manager. I took a Polaroid photograph of myself looking so tired and I kept it just to remind me, don't do that job again, Sophie. You, you, if you're a location manager, you do not sleep. I had to have two minders. It was really dangerous. You have to be able to pick up parked cars and move them. I tell you, it's a tough job. And I went for my promotion to be a production manager. And I couldn't see myself being a production manager because it's a tough job. And that's when you're in charge of the production and the schedule. And I, it was the normal step on the rung before you became a director. And I didn't get my interview and I was so upset. They gave the job instead to one of my trainees. And I, but I was reading the BBC internal newspaper, it's called Ariel. And it said um, in BBC schools, they're looking for someone with drama experience to be an assistant producer. My boyfriend was an assistant producer in the natural history unit. And as assistant producer, it's basically you're a staff director at the BBC not on big dramas, but on anything else really. And so I applied and I went for this interview and I got the job as an assistant producer on school. And I worked for the most wonderful, wonderful executive producer called Len Brown. He said, off you go. Um, and I said, well, these are my ideas. And he said, no, 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 I don't wanna know. He said, just bring me the rough cut. The rough cut, huh? So that means go and make four documentaries. And I went and I made four documentaries and I could do whatever I liked. So, you know, Mike Lee had made those wonderful um, uh, improvised dramas. So I thought, well, mm. I tried doing a bit of improvised drama. And I worked at White City Comprehensive and I worked with this wonderful teacher. I had the run of the whole school, had the 11, 12 year old kids. And we were just working within school hours. It was all right with the government and everything, children's licenses. And I did documentary footage. I interviewed them and then we illustrated what they said. And I made these two programs that were 
fabulous. One was about co-education. It's what I called it, what girls about boys and boys about girls. And it's what girls think about boys and what boys think about girls. And these children were hilarious. And the other one was about bullying. And the children were amazing. And we got this fabulous, fabulous story about bullying and how it happens. And I called it the way people talk. And the story was that they were, they'd been bullying this kid because he spoke posh. <gasps> um, but they, we made this lovely little story about why the bully bullied. And it's because he was having a hard time at home and he got asthma and he was, he was very sorry about his bullying. It was just perfect. And they were such good films. Thanks to the kids. And, um, they were such good films. And I actually, one thing that bugged me was, you know, in school's television, they had a clock. <gasps> and I saw a slide of my own face, my own a photograph of me was put up with the clock it had become digital by then. And I thought, no, 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 no. They can't broadcast daytime television and have still have the clock on BBC television. So I put this proposal to the head of the department saying, you, we got to get rid of the clock. And perhaps we could use these um, little programmes I made as shorts or cut them down and make them as shorts and have them instead of the clock. And that's what they did. And they put out those problem programmes again and again and again. They were repeated. And I do know I don't have copies of them. I lost my copies, um, but they were really good. And I made a, some other documentaries. And then I went to, I worked um, really as a second unit director on a big drama series that schools television brought out called Through the Dragon's Eye. And it was very- Yeah, I, I remember that very fondly. That was whoa, a whoa, program whoa. I saw as uh, a young Dragon's boy Eye. sat there in the, in my classroom and yes. it brings back fond memories. And I remember watching it recently on YouTube, I, I think. Yeah. And we I produced the storybook that I have somewhere it's here that came out with it. And I did, I directed the title sequence, I directed all the animations that they run in, I directed all the they, we call them video effects, and I worked with a visual effects designer. And then I took over and did some sequences for the director with a big drama, um, working with one of the top producer directors um, in BBC Education. She'd done all the look and reads and uh, exhausting actually. And it was all shot on the film stages at Ealing. And I had my own PA um, and I worked with the most impressive um, video effects uh, designer, we call them. Um, but really they're directing quite groundbreaking stuff. And I directed this sequence with the mouse. Actually, it's amazing what a mouse can do. A little live mouse uh, um, at the visual effects department in North London. Um, really good fun. It's, that's what I'd really wanted to do. I'd really wanted to do drama with animation. But when I was doing it, it was all like, just fitting things together and it wasn't as I it was actually a bit of an anticlimax I didn't like it as much as I thought I would do but by this time now I've got a bit of experience as an assistant producer and the head of department calls me in I saw him in the lift and he goes oh oh Sophie um uh could you have you got a copy of the VHS um have you got a VHS copy of your film and I thought, oh, he wants to see my film I've just directed. I was so chuffed. And he goes, I said, I've, I've got a copy, but it's got time code on it. Do you mind? And he goes, oh, no, I don't mean that. I mean the Fitch film, Swallows and Amazon. Oh, that. <laughs> Actually, my first films that I directed came out in the Radio Times the same week as Swallows and Amazon. So there I am in the film and here at the top of the page is the film that I actually treasured much more, although it was just being broadcast on daytime television. But I was young, I was 28 and same um, head of department had me in. He said, Sophie, right, I would like you to produce this um, series called Inset. And I went, oh no, <laughs> you must be joking. Do you know what Inset is? 
in-service teacher training. So this was the series for teachers to watch at lunchtime on how they should be implementing the infant core curriculum when it first came out. <laughs> the national curriculum. I had no experience for education at all, apart from that I'd been to rather bad school, was going to be teaching teachers how to teach well. Oh, just academically, this blew my mind. Anyway, we had very, very, very good education officers, three of them working. BBC Education was huge then because it was a major part of the charter. It was a wonderful department because we could break new ground, we could do whatever we liked, we could we could really break the boundaries of television. And our budgets weren't, well, it, the budget was high on uh, Flu the Dragon's Eye, very high. But for my for inset series, just average, you could just, what do you want to do, Sophie? So I put in the budget form and I said, right, we, it's a national, national curriculum. We've got to go north. We've got to, I'm not going to make something that's just all set in London and expect teachers in the north of England to take this on board. <laughs> it's really because I wanted to go and film in Cumbria. Anyway, I, I rang up the education authorities and, and um, my education officer said, look, ring up the best education authorities, ask them for the best teachers and point the camera at them. You can't go wrong. But make sure you're going to be filming in the schools that are up against it. You can't, it, you can't go to a school with wonderful facilities and really bright kids and expect teachers who are up against it to take on board those teaching techniques. So you've got to have an inner city school like Sheffield. Okay, so I went to Sheffield. Village school where teachers teaching children of all different age groups. So I went to um, uh, Cumbria. And then I profiled a wonderful school on a big council estate in Wiltshire and the teachers were amazing. And I did what the education officer told me to do and I pointed the camera at these amazing, amazing teachers. And I didn't use a presenter. I interviewed the teachers. I transcribed everything they said to me and very, very carefully joined all that together to do the voiceover. And I worked with a very expert film uh, editor and I've had that little bit of experience. But now I've edited quite a few things. And I was filming four-year-olds and four-year-olds just, they don't care if the camera's right there or there. They just go on doing their thing. And they were very, very amusing. And <coughs> those, those films were charming because the children were charming and they're interesting because the teachers were interesting. And I just fitted it all together. And I can remember, going to Lime Grove where we that's where all the current affairs programs used to be made and where my film editor was based and I was going oh lord how am I going to put these documentaries together because they were fly on the wall documentaries effectively and I was going Jesus you're a carpenter you know how to put things together help me and amazingly they went together and these were shot on sort of quite early beta cam and then after that I did what was my real heart's desire was I was asked to direct comedy drama shot with proper cast Patsy Kensich remember she was nursing in Blackadder she was my star and I was directing it was called Think About Science I cast the children um we had a the, the main character was age six so I cast identical twins to play the one character and um, I had this brilliant little guy who was deaf um, who played the deaf kid in it so because we wanted to represent disabled children and I had such a good girl playing the 12 year old and they were very very good um, comedy dramas and I absolutely loved that and I was asked to direct the second series and disaster disaster I fell ill and I went ill with a mystery disease and I think what it was was Asian flu that kept reoccurring because it struck me down when I was editing it struck me down at Christmas and my brother-in-law got the same virus 
And then I got ill when I was editing and then I got ill over Easter and I just could not get better. And I just went like a dormouse and my parents had to come and collect me. They had to take me back to the farm in Gloucestershire and I, I just couldn't function. And I had to be replaced by another director at work. I'd started filming. I'd been mm. on set filming. I actually collapsed in the office, um, but it, it was like complete and utter disaster. And I really had done pretty well in my career. And I'd had these amazing opportunities. I'd worked with amazing people. Everything had actually gone really well and suddenly shut down. And I went to see the BBC doctor. My ma the assistant manager found me in the office uh, so ill that she sent me in a taxi to the BBC doctor. And I'm very glad she did because he had come out on location for my family and other animals. He said, oh, I know you. Um, he said, I couldn't believe how much energy you had on the set of my family and other animals. He said, you can't be doing your job unless you can, you're physically fit. He said, I don't want you to come back to work until you can look me in the eye and say you've been playing tennis every day for 10 days. So I went home and it was almost like being a child. I was 30 and single and I, my mother put me to bed with a hot water bottle. And I slept and the BBC doctor said, look, keep a diary of how you feel. He said, I don't want you to come back to work just because you're feeling a little bit better. Um, so keep a diary. And I kept a diary. And years later, I typed it up. And this is the story of 10 months I spent stuck in bed with this mystery disease. I think what had happened is the Asian flu gave me the equivalent of long COVID, post-viral mm. fatigue, ME, and uh, it wasn't fun. And after a while, I got quite depressed. Um, I think on top of it, definitely on top of it, uh, because you can do a test for it, I, I'd been told to take leave, and I had to take leave in March. And it's like, where do you go on holiday in March? And they're going, oh, no, you must have leave between two series. You've got to rest. And I'd gone to South Africa to um, stay with a friend who did horse safaris, but I caught tick bite fever. And I'd been put on tetracycline. And when I went back to work, I went back to work really hard, running around while I was still on tetracycline, which is a powerful antibiotic. So it was a combination of post viral fatigue, the flu, tick bite fever. I wasn't in with a chance. I think these viruses migrate into your pancreas or your liver or something. So in a way, this is a sort of study of the equivalent of long COVID, but like 30 years ago. And it's funny stories of things that happened to me when I was working for television because I was still in contact with everybody and I was mulling over things when I was bored out of my mind in bed. Um, and it's funny stories about my family and what they were doing. And I was like the happy prisoner away in a way observing the mad antics of my parents and my sisters my sisters Perry and Tamsin were acting in adverts and they had babies and will you look after my baby I was like no I can't even get to the bathroom hardly I can't look after your baby but I did and they went off to make their advert for British Gas and it was hysterical so it's really a comedy that book but it's in a way a bit of a dark comedy, but it's a great book to read if you know and to give to someone who you know has got blue and you think you stay in bed or you'll end up like Sophie. And I was so ill I couldn't recover. And I saw a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful physician. She actually practiced in Harley Street and she'd been an allergist and she said, you, you've got to get out of England um, because I, I don't know if you can hear, but I have an allergy to mold. It bungs me up when I'm a bit nasal. And um, I said, oh, my friend's invited me to South Africa. She said, well, if you can go and she'll look after you, go, because you need to be in an arid climate. I didn't realise that this doctor had been the Princess Wales's private physician. She was very senior. Anyway, I was so ill 
that by the time my plane ticket came up, my sister had to virtually pour me onto the aeroplane. But I flew to South Africa and I got better in five days. A trout was on. The weather was like it is now. And I wrote to my sisters saying, I actually recovered really quickly out here. And my friend was running the horse safaris and she needed to cook. So I started cooking for her and I was really living the dream because I'd always rather longed to be a cowboy. <laughs> and I'd always rather longed to see if I could paint for a living. And this book is um, the recording of me making my way um, through Southern Africa as a wildlife artist. I don't know if any of these pictures turn up. Oh, wow. There was one on the cover. And the book's made up of my letters to my sisters and their letters to me. And I was working very hard on horse safaris. I became a horse safari guide. Then I fell off and broke my pelvis and was in bed for another, like, six weeks. Um, but while I was on crutches, I started painting professionally. And I got a lot of commissions. And I got a lot of commissions for drawing maps. And at university, I'd done a course in cartography, which proved really useful. And I'd been influenced by uh, Arthur Ransom ever since I was 12, and been um, inspired by the end papers of Swallows and Amazons to draw maps. And I started drawing them professionally, these sort of decorative maps. And I don't know if this, no, I haven't got any on the walls, but um, I got, uh, I listed them once. I did 42 maps, basically of people's game reserves. It was before GPS came out. <laughs> As a guide, I knew it was kind of, the holiday makers, the people coming out had to really trust us because we just ride into the bush. They didn't know where they were going. And they kind of said, do you ever get lost? <laughs> and I go, oh, no, not very often. <laughs> And I was okay because I was a horse safari guide on horseback. And the horse kind of always pulled slightly towards home. Well, the one I used to lead on had a very good sense of direction. And I used it on purpose so I wouldn't get lost. Did get lost. It's quite interesting. I got one lost once when it was overcast at midday because you... You navigate by the sun, actually, subconsciously, and the horses do as well. Um, so I did get lost once after tracking giraffe up on the plain. Well, there's, a, there's a map I drew, and I did that for uh, charity, Save, Save the Rhino charity in Namibia. And I, it, I ended up driving with my paintbrush all over Southern Africa. So uh, Botswana, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, South Africa, into Zambia and I put forward a proposal to the BBC and by this time an old friend of mine was head of department of BBC Natural History Unit and my series got number one slot that's the eight o'clock Thursday night BBC one viewing slot and the series idea was to look at people working with animals in the bush and so I got I was demoted to being a researcher, but hey, I was the South African, Southern African facilitator for that series. So I set up the documentaries on, uh, I did two in Botswana, uh, one about uh, uh, a night, a night safari, uh, because I've been doing these myself on moonlit nights, actually riding with animals at night, which is an extraordinary experience. You, you need a full moon, but it's a bit dangerous otherwise. Um, and uh, to go out at night, and they'd never done uh, a nocturnal documentary of that caliber in the African bush before. And then one of them was uh, in Namibia and doing the recce was amazing. So I crossed um, Northern Namibia and down the skeleton coast with the game rangers, uh, absolutely wonderful. And we did another one in Botswana and so it was really wonderful setting them up. And then my ideas further north launched a career of a television presenter who'd been, um, uh, she was doing a PhD on primates, Charlotte uh, Allenbrook, and it launched her career as a television presenter. And actually I 
if I'd done a PhD myself, I might have done a PhD on gorillas uh, because that was hadn't been studied um, um, comprehensively. So it was lovely how things began to come round. And then I set up um, another, a live watch um, with the same director who directed me in Animal Magic, Robin Hellier. Um, so he was the director on the live watch that I set up. And then I got to set up Blue Peter Southern Africa Exploration. And I set that up and I found them a little boy who was rather like Gerald Farrell to profile. So I did that. Um, and then I, but by this time, my art was really taking off. So I actually, uh, also I was, was getting a bit uh, serious on the safety and uh, responsibility front. So I decided to concentrate on my art. And I went on living in South Africa, really, until I met my husband in 2004, but he lives in England, so then I came back here. But I don't think I could have come back unless it was for happy reason, because I got very attached to all the projects I was volunteering on um, uh, or working on between contracts. Um, we, you know, the AIDS pandemic was taking Africa by storm and particularly South Africa. And so I helped set up uh, a very important project, uh, raising awareness and helping people cope with HIV AIDS. The pandemic hit the town where I was based very, very heavily. Uh, at one stage, we are looking after a thousand patients and we just could not stand by and not do anything. And so we did what we could, but uh, apparently a million people a year are still dying of HIV AIDS. And we set up a UK charity, and I still uh, volunteer on that. I'm the webmaster. Uh, we call it the Waterberg Trust. And so I'm raising funds at the moment. And I returned to Southern Africa, and I've done, um, I think, six big challenge rides to raise funds uh, to help really the young people and uplift them uh, and help them have a really good start in life. So we employ a, a nurse who works in the community. And I'm raising money to end period poverty in uh, this rural area called the Waterberg. Uh, and then also send young people on a conservation course. Um, many of them become game rangers or go into work in conservation, wildlife conservation as a result. So that's nice. And I've been writing about that. Um, and I, at the moment, I'm preparing to the historical, actually, um, uh, novels uh, about set in East Africa. My family actually emigrated to Tanzania in 1919 and grew pyrethrum um, to save the world from malaria. And so I do have quite deep roots. Um, I wasn't just an immigrant. Um, I, someone said um, I wasn't of African descent. Well, yeah, but my family had been working there and my, my great uncle was in the police force, another great uncle who was in the judiciary, um, really helping the countries to develop and um, uh, doing what they could to help the people um, in those countries. Um, so I have a bit of a heritage and I probably have to atone for the dreadful things that my great grandfather did um, because he really liked oh, shooting anything that moved trophy animals but only male animals only the big so, old male Sophie can I can I ask you one final question mm. and then we'll move on to the quick fire 13 questions that we ask all your oh. take yes the last question we've spoken about the many areas and capacities you've worked in acting floor managing researching producing directing and a published author as well do you have a favorite discipline and if so, which one and why? Oh, I enjoy writing and I can, I'm a bit of a workaholic, but I can at least work quietly at home um, and I can fit in other things with it, like my sport and my archery and 
are just family life. Um, so yeah, I really enjoy uh, creative writing, if you like, uh, but I also uh, enjoy non-fiction writing. So I write quite a lot of articles and I keep a blog uh, and I keep a number of blogs actually, but you can find me on sophienevel.net and um, ask and me questions, challenge me. And <laughs> Sophie, we come on to the final quick fire 13 questions. We ask all your take guests exactly the same questions. First thing that comes into your mind to find out things maybe we not established about you during the interview. So here they are quickly. Number one, what is your favourite pastime? I like walking along beaches and I take my litter picker and pick up any plastic pollution. We move on to cinema next and we've spoken quite a lot about the cinema, obviously, and your um, famous role in Swallows and Amazons. But what is your favourite film and why? Oof, I don't have one, but obviously Scholars and Amazons had a huge influence on my life, bigger than I ever thought. Um, that's the film I've watched a, a number of times. It is mesmerising and it's wonderful to watch it with a cinema audience because they pick up on the humour and uh, it's wonderful to see the effect that it has on children. So it is edifying. But I don't have another favourite film. <laughs> A passion for writing, which you've mentioned in this conversation, yeah. but who would you cite as your favourite novelist? Oh, uh, I can never pronounce her name. I've just read a book called Joe Barker. That was good. And um, Karen, I have to go and get a book. I haven't got her name in front of me. It's all right. No problem. We can quickly move on. Who would you say? Sorry, yeah. if you could have chosen a different profession, apologies. What would it have been? Different profession altogether? Yeah. Ooh, well, I quite like being a horse safari guide, actually. But I, I did do that for two years. Um, but it, it's quite physical. And uh, <laughs> um, I probably would end up being eaten. Um, a different profession. Now, I've lived five lives. Um, yeah, I think you have to work within your own calling and your own gifting so well, I can't think of anything else yeah perhaps I would enjoy being a gorilla researcher who would you say in life has been your greatest inspiration well I think Virginia McKenna is a very inspirational person um, and she's done terrific work in making films and producing films really um, like uh, she and Bill her husband they went on to make an elephant called Slowly and other films in Africa. Uh, and she set up a very important charity in Born Free. So she has been um, a great inspiration and I'm still in touch with her. Um, Claude Wotham was a great inspiration to me, but I meet lots of inspirational people. So no one, no one person particularly. Next, we move on to the newspapers. Do you read a newspaper? And if so, which one? Oh, my husband has a Times every day, so I read that. But I prefer like nice big paper like the Telegraph. That's the biggest one. And it's really useful having that newspaper for a number of reasons when you're a housewife like me. <laughs> and it's a very good me... for cleaning glass. Um, I like the <laughs> Telegraph because I can use it to clean my, my these are my pictures, to, to clean the glass when I'm framing. <laughs> <laughs> who needs a duster when you've got a newspaper? Um, yes. What would you say? What would you say is your favourite food? Oh, I rather like um, I rather like gravelax. <laughs> I th I think I, my Scottish ancestry has dictated uh, what I should eat. So I like um, I go to the village shop. And I buy this Dexter's meat and they're the little Dexter cattle that are reared on the forest and porridge and gravelax. And I think it's just we should eat what our ancestors ate. And I'm probably got most energy for that duck. I need to eat duck and duck is the was the food that stops me from getting fatigue. 
So if you feel COVID-y and you feel you've got post viral fatigue coming along, eat duck and marmite and bathe in Epsom salts. Who would you next say is your favourite cultural icon? Oh, I just don't have one. Um, but I do, I've got a deep appreciation for all good writers at the moment. <laughs> Move on next to curse words. Ooh, what would you say care. is your favourite curse word and why? I try not to swear. I think it's uh, you should if you're if you're swearing, it's an indication that you need to extend your vocabulary. <laughs> I don't swear. What would you say is your favourite place or holiday destination? Oh, I'm very much drawn back to the African bush, but I like coasts and I have booked a horse riding holiday down the coast of Portugal but I'm happy on any beach anywhere at any time and I love deserts. I cross the Namib desert on a horse, I cross the Sahara desert, not on a, not on a horse, no vehicle, uh, and so I'm quite up for a desert holiday um would I like to live in Namibia yes I would I really liked I really enjoyed it I really liked it from places now to music who would you say is your favorite music artist and what is your favorite album <gasps> well I when I was a horse safari guide we had Cat Stevens greatest hits and I would literally ride my horse and hipping and hopping on a moon shadow very exciting. Um, I, I like a lot of period music and I have classic FM on in the house all day long. And they're always playing the great theme tunes from films. They never play the theme music as well as Nansen's. Um, please request it of them. Um, <laughs> um, but I was, I grew up on the Beatles and the, the, uh, the year I was born, it was Tell Laura I Love Her and Save the Last Dance for Me. Mm. So those have to be my kind of theme tunes. Save the Last Dance for Me. Sophie, what is your greatest achievement to date? Oh, oh bringing out the books. Um, I was so excited when the first box of, of these copies arrived. This book was it's incredibly exposing to put your life on the line. And actually, I self-published this because it was about all the people I love most. And I was very vulnerable at the time. It's a very true life. And um, very difficult actually to write. And I want, didn't want to compromise my friends. Um, all my family and in fact I had to change some of the names because my brother-in-law was doing such a dangerous job I had to change his name he's now become a military historian and I changed his name back again <laughs> and the names of his children um, but otherwise I only had to change the names of someone's village because they realized actually that we could use their real names but their job was they had to have client confidentiality in their job so I changed the name of one of the villages. It was a bit of a shame because the village was quite amusing. But, yeah, that was, it's a huge achievement bringing out a book, I think, by yourself, for anybody. Um, and so actually, I, it was a greater achievement doing those than, for instance, producing my own television series. I, maybe books have a greater durability. Um, but... Uh, you get support and help when you're making, you know, you've got a big team behind you when you're making a film or a television program. So it's a team product. Um, and the making the films and television programs, the act of making them was more important to me than the end product for some reason. I enjoyed it, I suppose. It was very social. Whereas the books, it's actually what it smells like. <laughs> <laughs> it's out it's, there. Oh, it's on the shelves and you see it in shops and oh yes um so yes I 
the books. The books. And then not the uh, archery titles. And then <laughs> they, uh, they mean very little. <laughs> and lastly, Sophie yeah. Neville, the final question, your take question: How do you wish to be remembered? I hope I've been able to inspire. If I've been able to inspire one person, that is enough. A lovely way to end the Your Take interview. Thank you for sharing your life story, your journey, which has covered so many different areas from your childhood to your acting breakthrough and, of course, your fondness of working on set on uh, Swallows and Amazons and the books that followed. You work behind the scenes in various capacities. Thanks for being a guest and I wish you all the very best with any future endeavours. Thank you.